Hi, everybody. Welcome back to day one of The Grill 2020. I'm Steve Pond, the awards editor of The Wrap, and this panel is the evolution of film festivals. Um, I'm not sure actually if it's an evolution or a pandemic-inspired revolution, but maybe we'll figure that out. Um, I'm going to be talking to the panelists for about 35 minutes, uh, then we'll take questions from the audience for about another 10. If you want to ask a question, you can add it to the comments section on the right-hand side of the screen, and the RAP team will post those questions on the screen. Um, and after the panel, the all-access ticket pass holders are invited to join the conversation on RAP Connect via Slack. So now I would like to introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. Michael Barker is the co-president of Sony Pictures Classics. He has four decades of experience as a movie executive, and his films have received 173 Oscar nominations, including Best Picture nominations for Call Me By Your Name, Whiplash, Amour, Midnight in Paris, and Education, Capote, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Howard's End. Tabitha Jackson is the director of the Sundance Film Festival. Prior to being appointed to that position in January, she served as director of the documentary film program at the Sundance Institute. Kathleen McInnes runs See Through Films. She has 30 years of experience in festival programming, producing, and film publicity, and she specializes in helping international filmmakers merge their creative and business development through the festival circuit. And Jane Rosenthal is the CEO and co-founder of Tribeca Enterprises, which includes the Tribeca Film Festival. She's also an Oscar and Emmy-nominated film producer whose work includes The Irishman and the Netflix miniseries When They See Us. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and I think I, I want to start by asking a very broad question, which is, you know, we've all been to film festivals and the experience of going to a festival and seeing a great movie for the first time in a big room that's crammed full of people. I mean, there are a few things that are more thrilling than that in, in the world of movies. And I wonder if you take that away, do you lose the essence of a film festival? Um, and I, I'll throw that open to anybody, but Tabitha, maybe, I mean, you've obviously been part of that crowd many, many times at Sundance. I have, and there's something absolutely incredible about it. Um, you know, thinking in this moment about what we most miss, um, sound. It's the sound, it's the sound of an audience gasping or the sound of an audience being entirely silent. Uh, or the sound of an audience laughing, um, which is unbeatable. Um, and there is nothing that compares to that. But that isn't the essence of a film festival. I think that's the essence of the theatrical experience. And a film festival is the films, it's the artists, it's the audiences, it's the discourse that comes from that. And so I think in this moment, I'm keen to reflect less on what we have lost, um, but what might be gained. And the essence is a coming together, but there are different ways of coming together and the feeling will be different and the form will be different, but we haven't lost the essence of film festivals. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to just add that um, what, we're, what Tabitha described as missing the audience, we're missing that just in our everyday human touch with each other. Uh, so we're all being deprived of something that we have. This is what we know in life is to, is to gather, whether it's concerts or comedy or movies or in a park or in a restaurant. Um, so there is something that has been lost, but in, that loss and that grief, there is um, something that it will be totally transformational. And it's not just uh, for film festivals, but I look at that you know, almost in every strata of both, um, of all of our systems, of how our, our culture and economy can work and things that might have taken um, 25 years to do, we'll now hopefully be able to do them uh, in the next five to 10 years. Um, but we all need to go vote too, so. <laughs> yeah, well, Kathleen, from your point of view, advising filmmakers who are going to festivals, I, I imagine that it's, it's a very different world they're going into right now than it would have been a year ago. 
it is a very different world and it's also a very different world week to week and month to month i mean what we were talking about in march is not what we're talking about any longer uh things are changing that fast i agree with what tabitha said it's not the essence of the festival that's lost um and in talking to my filmmakers we talk about the three things that they can still get uh clearly you can still have you know the value of the laurels there are festivals that are that are tastemaker festivals let's say discovery festivals you can still have the value of juried competition not because awards are important but because they help to prove audience and to help further audience. And if you are a smart filmmaker and if you are prepared, you can also, with some festivals, depending on how the festivals work, you can still get that audience to join you as uh, almost as a vanguard, almost as a, an army. Um, you, if you can bring them into your world, if you can bring them into your social media, let's say, and you can capture them and keep them you can still get some audience on your side in this, what I hope is temporary time space where we can't have them in real life. It's not quite the same, but it's something. Right, yeah. Well, let's, um, do we have Michael back? I know he's, uh, yeah. All right, well, let, let's back up to January um, when this year's Sundance was, was taking place. I mean, there was talk at the time about this thing, the coronavirus, but it didn't really become big news until, you know, until the, say a month later. I mean, Tabitha, was this something that you guys at Sundance were, were thinking about at all at the time? Very likely it was something that was going on somewhere else. Um, and um, it wasn't um, a public health consideration uh, during our festival. We were incredibly lucky um, to be able to have put on a full festival in the way that we wish to um, at that moment. Um, and it wasn't really, it was when I was at True False, so early March, when we were being very um, considerate and there was the kind of half-hearted, awkward elbow bumps, uh, but still, you know, full houses of, of people without not wearing masks. So it came later. Um, uh, so we were just incredibly lucky and are again lucky by, as we see our colleagues who either made an incredibly quick pivot uh, or decided to, they couldn't go ahead or now the full festivals in a different model. It's what Kathleen is saying, like every month there's a different manifestation of these this thing and what it means. So projecting forward to January, I don't think we're going to be out of the woods in any sense. Um, but we have been able to learn from our colleagues who have tried to keep this independent project going in the act of watching films together. Yeah. Well, s speaking of that pivot, I mean, Jane, you guys, I'm sure, were in the thick of planning for a physical Tribeca when suddenly it became clearer and clearer that maybe that wasn't going to be possible. I mean, what at what stage did you did you realize we might have to, you know, think about Think about something else here. Um, it was Bob and I literally got home from um, the Oscars from LA on February 9th. Uh, by February 12th, we were um, we had officially postponed uh, the film festival. Uh, sorry, March 12th, we had officially postponed, not February. We started hearing about uh, what was going on. Um, around February 12th. Um, and we knew that if they shut down New York schools, if they shut down Broadway, um, you know, NBA, all of that, we were, uh, we were gonna have to postpone. So we monitored that situation very, very carefully uh, as, you know, so we were cautious about what we were committing to and bringing additional people on and, and uh, checking with our various sponsors on that. Uh, then when the governor uh, said that it was going to be uh, by March, he, I guess he said March 12th, uh, that's when you couldn't, uh, you couldn't gather, gather more than uh, 500 people. That's when, that's when we postponed. Mm -hmm. 
but at the same time, you postponed, but you kept your juries together and you still had them right. look at the, the films and, and you gave out the prizes. Was that yes. important? Yes. Yeah, it was very important. It was, look, we're a film festival that started after 9-11. If anybody told me 19 years ago that I'd still be talking to you about a film festival, um, you know, the Tribeca Film Festival, I, I would have, yeah, I, I would have been surprised. Uh, we had done that first festival um, 120 days after 9-11 to bring people back downtown, to bring people together. So our whole ethos, our very being has been around bringing people together, to gather out of a tragedy. What struck us here was like, we can't gather. The very thing that drew us together, that made that first festival so special, we couldn't do anymore. And uh, so it became important to keep the juries together, to keep do whatever we could online. Uh, we were putting out shorts by our wonderful senior programmer, Sharon Bedell, a short film a day keeps anxiety away. We started doing that right away. Um, and you know, it was again important to give the filmmakers their laurels to screen uh, as much as we could, um, you know, to the public, but very specifically for audience and press to be able to get those reviews for the filmmakers. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, that was that was that was important to us as well as what we did with our VR, and that was all available to anybody who had an Oculus. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Kathleen, for you, I mean, you're looking forward to the summer. You're probably dealing with filmmakers who are, you know, might be going to Cannes or going to Carlo Vivari or, or going to all of the summer festivals. Do, do you continue talking to them and trying to figure things out? Or you just say, we got to put it on hold? I mean, what's... <laughs> so I was, I was actually in Berlin when I started hearing what was happening. And I came home the the normal time I was going to come home anyway. And I, my mom lives up in Washington state and I went up there to see her and Washington started to close down pretty quickly. I thought I was going to be out of a job and not have anything to do. I've never been as busy as I am and have been in these past few months. I, I can work 14 hours a day and I still can't keep up. Um, everybody is trying to figure out how do you look at this? How do you break this down? How do you, how do you figure out what's important, what's not important? And then we have so many fractions that come at us at the same time. What are sales agents gonna do? What are audiences gonna do? Will anybody show up? Is there such a thing as online film festival fatigue, which I hate to say, I think might be real. Um, there's lots of things that we're putting into the mix here and every single filmmaker or every single group of people that I work with are like, we need to figure this out. We need to find out what's best. So I'm still in the thick of it and I've been in the thick of it, I think. I feel like at least that I've been in the thick of it since March. There's, there's all filmmakers still have the same questions or a version and evolution of the question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it looks like we have Michael Barker back. Um, Michael, I mean, you, you guys, bought a couple films at at Sundance. Um, looking forward to this year, you had films like, um, you know, like, like The Father and The Truffle Hunters that ordinarily you would be rolling out at film festivals over the rest of the year. Um, so how, how did all of this affect your planning for, for your films um, going forward? And maybe we don't have Michael after all. Um, okay. Well, un until we until we get him back, let me just um, talk about something that I think it's I think Jane, you guys started it with, which is the the We Are One program on on YouTube, where I think twenty one different film festivals from around the world contributed um, to a, a group of films that ran for ten days. And it does feel like one of the things that has become important in the festival community has really been, you know, sort of cooperation, and we're all in this together. Um, I mean, what was how did how did We Are One come about, and what were your initial conversations with with the other festivals like? Well, um, it came about really because we couldn't gather, and I was struck with the fact that we, because we had started after nine eleven, uh, and because of 
what it meant to the community to gather, that how could we as film festivals all gather and do something, because this was a global issue, it wasn't just a New York issue, uh, it wasn't just a US issue, and how could we gather? You look at musicians and actors and the various benefits that they do for things, and they, they all cooperate. Why couldn't we all cooperate? There were so many great things that we could all do together. and we started reaching out and Tabitha was wonderful and Kathleen and everyone from Toronto and uh, our, our, our friends in Ber Berlin and, and Cannes and Venice and Shanghai. It was, really, it was really quite extraordinary. And they all programmed, each festival, including Tribeca, programmed uh, uh, 10 hours and uh, there were some new new films, some films that hadn't been seen to a global audience, but only had been seen uh, in that uh, in the country. And um, we had uh, uh, YouTube uh, had greenlit the project uh, on April on April 7th. And um, we began by uh, May May 29th. It was like doing a hundred hour live program. But I, I but it, again, I think for me uh, personally, it's, it was this same kind of feeling I had after 9-11, like what could we do to bring people together? What could we do? Because if we could, uh, if I could reach out to Tabitha and give her a virtual hug and Kathleen and everybody, then it didn't feel quite as lonely or as isolated. And um, it, it uh, I know for for me, I haven't been on the festival circuit as long as um, my colleagues here, but um, it, it was it was really it was really amazing for us and for our programmers, uh, Cara, um, Cara and uh, Frederick and Paula and Sharon. I mean, everyone just uh, we so enjoyed being able to talk to everybody. Can we? Can I just add in too for to Jane because for this talking about the shorts filmmakers in particular, they were getting views that they would never get anywhere else two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, a million, whatever the numbers were. Yeah. So, as much as it's also you know pretty terrific that Jane had this instinct to say, how do we bring everybody together? For the from the filmmakers' perspective, they got to be seen by people that they would normally not ever have had that chance to be to be seen by. I, I agree, it was, a, it was a real, it was a real moment and um, this this sense that, that um, you know, Jane allowed us to channel this feeling, as you say, of what, what can we do? But it was, and it was born of a particular moment when we didn't know how long this was gonna last. It seemed like something had ruptured, but it may come back together soon. I don't think any of us realized we were in it for this long and ongoing. And so the question shortly thereafter became, there is the coming together and the recognizing something that's bigger than oneself. But the real questions now, which Kathleen must be dealing with every single day is how do artists, how do we keep artists Yes, how do we keep our own institution sustainable, but how do we keep artists sustainable? They have poured their lives and their resources into making this work, which is not now not being seen or seen in very fragmented ways. Um, they are not earning. They are the, in, we are in danger of losing a cohort of, of artists and voices and ideas. And it's I don't think any of us have an answer of what to do, but this, this long term, you know, as we think about the evolution of film festivals, we have to think about the evolution of the whole ecosystem and industry because it's something different now. I don't think we'll ever go back to what it was before, but what is it that we want to hold tight to and what is it that we need to let go? But it's it's also not just our film festivals when and the filmmakers and storytellers. It's the actors. You think about New York City and uh, the amount of actors and artists that are here that are currently unemployed. Uh, we don't know when Broadway will go back. We don't know when uh, flex performing art spaces will go back. We can't even get our kids fully back at school. So. Um, you know, it is a, and it's, 
it's a time where we're not getting the kind of science-based information that we need. I mean, clearly the industry uh, announced uh, last night that they will we'll be able to start production in a COVID safe way. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, definitely a struggle. Just audio. Okay. Um, well, I have I have Michael on the phone here. <laughs> so, I love it. We we can't get him on video, but we we have his voice here, and so Michael, let me let me go to you. I mean, you you guys bought a couple films out of Sundance. You have a couple movies that um, are on the festival circuit now, the Truffle Hunters and, and the Father, such as the festival circuit is. I mean, how does that change what you're doing, how you're rolling out your films and, and where you go okay. from here? Can, can everybody hear me? Um, first of all, I have been listening to everybody speak and I think it's important uh, for everyone to realize that film festivals are more important than they've ever been especially in this time of crisis. Um, I, you know, the thing about the history of movies from day one has always been to adapt and to adapt to things that are difficult. You could go all the way, you could see Cinema Paradiso where they just put up the sheet and that's the way they watch a movie and everybody laughs. It's, uh, we look at the history of the independent film, business, the independent film movement, and it's all adapting to different uh, difficulties, challenges, and crises. Well, here we've got one that's way beyond the pale. And uh, here we have all of these filmmakers, and I was listening to everyone talking, and, and Tabitha is so right on the money. It went, when uh, South by Southwest was closed down, I was horrified because I knew all of those filmmakers that would be their first time to see their movie in front of uh, uh, an audience or to have it be noticed, it totally disappears. And so there's a commitment to these new filmmakers. And also, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heavy responsibility, and the festivals have a, have a, a stronger responsibility than ever, ever before in that regard. And then there's the whole regard about movies that are the, the, the independent movies, the movies that open and are launched into the world, that are not launched based on 30-second commercials, or la not launched in thousands of screens, that require a word of mouth, that require, I think, of my own movies, like The Father, or I Carry You With Me, or any of these movies, Nine Days. And the, and the fact of the matter is, these films require time, require discussion, require conversation about the films, and the festivals always were vital to the life of those movies. And that is not going away, and it's more important than ever. Um, uh, it, it's a very difficult time for those of us in the movie business who work at film companies like the ones we have, not only with launching our own films, but at these festivals, we're able to network and understand what where filmmakers' concerns are, the kind of stories they're interested in telling, what the different audiences like and don't like in the moment. And the fact of the matter is, this adaptation that all of us are making with these film festivals, it's just vital. And I think, I think we will find, as Jane says, new information going forward. Um, and, and with our films, uh, it's, what's interesting about this pandemic is the whole uh, uh, mantra of, of Sony Pictures Classics and companies like mine is kind of slow and steady wins the race. That that it's like the tortoise in the hare and the word of mouth and letting movies out there percolate. People talk about them and see them. They have difficult uh, subject matter. But it, it, the, the showings in the festivals that, that give these films kind of attention and distinction that, and, and our uh, belief, we, we believe very positive in the future. So we're looking toward a better time when we can show the movies in the movie theaters. Um, but also to get to that better time, there has been no more vital institution than these festivals. Um, as far as our films are concerned, we deal with every film differently. 
we're very fortunate to have had our films selected, even though they weren't shown in Can or or in Telluride. But also the fact that we had a few pictures show at, at TIFF, and we have three films at the New York Film Festival. There's the AFI Fest. We have many films. Hamptons. We have many films. And I, I, I think that audience is there, and they're they're thirsting for that movie, and they get on the phone and they talk about that movie, which is what we all need for these movies to thrive. Right. What was actually very special when we did the We Are One is that you would be watching a movie live and it would be coming from Tokyo and you were watching live comments um, come up on the screen if you were in the chat rooms. And that was actually, it was, you know, it was like everybody whispering in, a, in the theater together. Um, that was a real interesting experience uh, that you know I've never had before <laughs> I mean I, I will say for me just you know we just had the Toronto Film Festival and I'm always there running around I saw the probably the same number of films this year as I would have seen if I had been there um, I didn't get nearly as many steps in but and I didn't really like watching them all in my living room but one thing I realized afterwards was given the makeup of the festival I saw a lot more young filmmakers, smaller films that if I had been in Toronto, I would have been going to the big premieres every night. Um, and I felt like in a way it showed Toronto as, you know, as what a lot of film festivals are, including yours, which is a showcase for, you know, younger, smaller, fresher, unrepresented voices. Um, and, and I but we still can't, you still can't replace that one element, which is that filmmaker getting that standing ovation or watching it with a big group on a big screen. So we can't lose sight of the fact that still is very important. It's just not something we can have now in that manner. Right. Yeah. I mean, Kathleen, you, you were working with, with a filmmaker who had a terrific documentary at, at mm -hmm. Toronto lift like a girl. Did you find that, you know, was it easier to get attention because it, you weren't dealing with, you know, four big awards movies premiering every night? It was, it was an interesting mix. So from the trades, there was no attention and they were very clear about it. They said documentaries aren't going to be our priority, but from everybody else, it was, it was easier because everything was happening sort of in the same fashion. So I can talk to my filmmaker in Egypt at the same time I'm talking to press anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And the bloggers and the, the writers who cover more editorially than just review, we're very excited to have that possibility, that engagement possibility. So it, on one hand, it was a tiny bit harder to do the business part of it. And on the other hand, it was much easier to spread the word. Mm -hmm. that, that kills me that that was the response about documentary. Oh, yeah. Just not. Oh, yeah. I, mean, it, okay. I, I can't. Like my head exploded so many times, it can't explode anymore. But <laughs> and I have. I, I'm loaded with documentaries right now because I. I was very afraid that we were going to have ghost films. So those films from March and April that were just going to disappear. And I think the one thing that I keep hearing and that I'm so grateful for, and Tabitha, I've heard you talk on other panels and every you know people in the community talking. Nobody in the festival world is forgetting the filmmakers. The filmmakers may not realize that, but none of us are forgetting them. Everybody in their own way is trying as hard as they can to make sure that there is something in this moment that can work for them. Mm -hmm. But I was so afraid, especially for the documentaries, because those are the smaller films, often the ones that I work with. And those are the ones that sort of get lost first. And I was actually really grateful to see that there was this, there was an access and an ability to engage throughout TIFF for Lift Like a Girl, at least. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's. Tabitha and Jane, let's talk about, you know, you're both now thinking about your festivals for next year. Um, you know, Tabitha, you're still planning, I guess, a, a slightly scaled down Sundance in in January. I mean, are are you committed to a physical festival in January? And and what are what are what's going through your your plan the planning right now? It would be insane to be committed to anything at this moment i think what we're what we're committed to is that that um you know as as 
uh, Bob Redford always said, you know, change is the only thing that is inevitable. So what we have to do is plan for what we what we would like to see uh, and plan for what's most realistic. So of course we are building a robust um, online platform where the films can express themselves, the conversation, the audiences, the coming together in whatever way that is, is possible there. We have to have that just in case we're still in this predicament or worse when flu season hits and just people can't gather, it's not safe. So that's our fundamental thing. That means our festival is safe. We can put on a festival. Um, and then because what my dream for this festival, which has in a kind of perverse way been allowed by the breaking open of things uh, during this pandemic, is that this festival can be held and it can be an act of collaboration and that communities and art houses in different places um, can hold a piece of this festival and we can create something together. Um, that is the thing that will need to be scaled up or down depending on public safety and the economic situation. But we're still planning that, but we're not committed to it. The thing we're committed to is everybody being safe and that we have a robust online expression. But yeah. the, the, the coming together, the community aspect, the, the way that a festival, which we, Park City will always be our home, but we know it's incredibly expensive to be there during the festival. It, it's unintended consequence is to exclude a lot of people who might otherwise wish to be part of this family this year, that can happen in a different way, but the essence to your, your first question, Steve, the essence of seeing a work and being able to talk about it and understanding how artists are seeing the world and our place in it and how that comes together, that can happen. People can experience their first Sundance from their bedroom. And for us, that's a good thing in terms of values. Right. Jane, what are you thinking of for Tribeca next year? I mean, I know you've pushed it from its usual spot in April to June, but um, you know, what stage are you are you at right now? We're really we're at the planning stages of it. Um, we have never been um, a festival that's abided by uh, by rules. Um, we've always been platform agnostic. Um, and look, the very start of it was to be for our community. It's like at the at in 2002, the world didn't need another film festival, but New York did. Um, I feel we're almost at our 20th anniversary. We're a little bit back to that feeling. Uh, and uh, we're in a densely populated city. So again, safety first. And we're looking at new ways to explore how we're going to be seeing films uh, throughout, throughout the city. Um, and you know, definitely not in a traditional way whatsoever. Yeah, right. Well, I think Tabitha, you mentioned something about we can't really, we can't ever go back to where to where we were. I mean, what what have the new models for festivals that have been forced on us by by COVID? What have they taught us that we should remember and continue to use after the pandemic is over? And I'll open this up to anybody who wants to to answer. I mean, I'll jump in if it's okay uh, with regards to filmmakers. I think that I think that the pandemic continues to teach us every day. Um, but the one thing that I will say that seems to be, I agree with Tabitha, we're never gonna go back to exactly what we were before. There's a whole horizon of new opportunities available to festivals and to filmmakers and to audience who are the key element here. But I think the one thing that has been recommitted is the importance of the sense of community from every single angle. Um, that you can't lose that when it comes to cinema. You can't, whether it's community of 600 people that you don't know in a dark theater watching the same thing, or community of people taking care of you even if they don't know you, or community of just bringing stories together. I think those are the things that we're learning are vital and that can't be lost in the movie making process. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said, Kathleen. <laughs> I think also this point, I mean, I think one of the key things is another thing that Kathleen said earlier, which is um, it's now possible 
to draw attention, to draw people's eyes, which is what we're trying to do, to draw people's eyes to artistry, ideas, cinema, um, in a way that doesn't depend on kind of being anointed either by, I say this, I, uh, it's paradoxical, but either by film festivals or by being picked up at a film festival, that is your journey into the world. That there's a, I think, a useful rupture in that distribution system. I mean that in the broader sense, because we understand as we as we were confronted by the pandemic, we were also confronted and uplifted by the uprising around uh, racial justice and violence. So we we are uh, more brutally aware of injustice and inequity within our own structures as well as that we see in the world. And so there are those things we don't want to go back to. There is a lot of work that needs to be done by us all um, in making it a more equitable landscape for, for artists to create and audiences to enjoy and those ideas to be circulated. Um, I think the audit of, of what we need to let go and what we need to hang on to is still being done, but there is so much. And I, I think I'm very excited about, um, yes, about this year, but, but it's such a crazy year. It's not really about this year in terms of festival. It's about the two, three, four, five years after that. How do we rise to it? How do we meet it? We're gonna have to write the future. So what is it that we want to write? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, before we go to audience questions, let me just say, you know, Michael, if you're if you're still with us, I mean, yeah, yes. Um, is there anything you you would like for for film festivals going forward from here? No, I think Tabitha said it best, um, and I think it's. I'm actually, it's really great that Tabitha is in that position because I think uh, festivals need to be visionary in a way. Um, with what we've been through in the last six, seven months, I think it's important for festivals to understand their importance in kind of the zeitgeist and how, uh, you know, the, it, it's important to, to, to think about the future years, uh, as Tabitha was speaking about, because it, there is going to be a new normal and it will have a lot of the aspects that, uh, people loved about uh, festivals and will survive and there are going to be new aspects that have to do with the new normal um, uh, both socially with being social conscious but also with the presentation of films and uh, uh, I think looking forward is very important and I think really taking these festivals on is a major responsibility that needs it needs to be important as well uh, Gone are the days when I think festivals are looked at as kind of slight uh, appendages to uh, uh, the, the film world. I think, uh, if anything, uh, they've proven to be so vital uh, uh, to film culture. And I think that's going to continue. And I think uh, it'll be very positive in the future. Right. Okay, well, I know we have some audience questions, so um, I think they'll put them, okay, yes. Um, how can filmmakers premiering their films digitally maximize impact with both the industry and audiences? Kathleen, this sounds like a question for you. This sounds like how I start my day, every single day. Um, so, Part of my answer is it depends on the kind of film you have and what you're doing. And if you have a sales agent, you have a different set of parameters than if you don't have a sales agent. So when you're trying to maximize your impact with industry, if you specifically, if you're working on trying to merge your business and creative development, you have to do the heavy lifting as the filmmaker and you have to do the outreach and you have to do the stuff that traditionally maybe other people were doing for you, or you have to be working with somebody, strategist, publicist, whoever, who can help you do that. The audience thing is a bigger issue. And this has to do with whether festivals are doing pre-recorded Q and A's or whether there are, they're setting up some kind of live interaction possibility, uh, which some festivals are beginning to do, where you actually have the ability to engage with the audience in real time. 
if you, the filmmaker, have a robust social media platform and you can bring those audiences that you engage with um, into your world and keep them, that is beneficial to you as a filmmaker. They're gonna follow you to your next film. They're gonna follow you as the artist. If you only have pre-recorded Q&A available to you, it's a lot harder. It's a lot more difficult. Right, okay. Um, we have another one. Let's see. Yes. Um, do you think the original film fest festival structure will go back to the way it was pre-COVID? For international films, this seems to be easier with virtual press junkets instead of traveling. Um, well, I, we all miss travel, right? Is there anybody on this panel who doesn't miss going to a festival? <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, yeah. No, and I think that just in the, 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 there is an ease, it, you know, one of the things that, one of the things I'm beginning to learn is the, just from these experiences is that there was a huge value to the ease of being watched, being able to watch the films, a huge value to a kind of seamless pre-recorded, whatever it might be, but it's actually the difficulties that, that make part of the festival experience for me. It's different, Sundance is hard, the weather is hard, um, it's it's there's a there's a, a scarcity of of tickets often, um, and it's it's those things. It's the glitches in the live if we're in this kind of environment that bring the energy. And um, I think with the kind of corporatization of so much stuff, getting back to the slightly messy, flawed deeply human experience is what we want. And I think the virtual press junkets, that does seem like, okay, well, that's easy if in that, in that slightly transactional relationship um, that, you, that you need, that's good. But the thing that we haven't yet cracked, which we're all trying to and learning from each other, is the serendipitous encounter, the person you meet on your way out of the press junket or going into it, that, that, that there has been a bringing together, as Jane said, a gathering of people that you then can can bump into and magic happens maybe then maybe two years later so just go we should go carefully with the ease and seamlessness of things because sometimes it's the struggle that makes the meaning it's also just that spontaneity that happens when you happen to be sitting next to somebody when you see somebody and say I like your scarf and they hand it to you I mean there's just little things that happen um, you know, when standing in line uh, or sitting next to somebody. Uh, and um, I don't miss wearing shoes that aren't comfortable, but um, there is, there's a spontaneity I miss. I just, and I miss, you know, again, hearing those audiences. Um, but to answer if we'll ever go back internationally pre-COVID, the way we fly, the way we move around the world is going to change. It has changed already. So uh, I don't imagine that nobody has a crystal ball here, but I don't imagine um, life as we knew it has completely changed and there'll be some exciting things to look forward to. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, I, I, I agree with, with all of you. It's that thing of you know, talking to the person next to you in line and hearing about a movie that you weren't planning on seeing that you suddenly realize you have to see, um, you know, and so I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to going back to, you know, to Sundance and to Tribeca and to Cannes and to Toronto and, and, you know, looking forward to running into, you know, Kathleen or Michael on a street corner or in a lobby. Um, but, you know, for, for now we'll have to, we'll have to do it this way. So, um, Thank you all for being part of this. It was a great conversation. Um, you know, thanks for participating and sharing your thoughts. And um, for the all access ticket holders, we can um, continue the conversation over on Rap Connect Slack channel. Um, so thanks very much. <laughs>